Good morning, dearly beloved. Welcome to you who are so familiar with this space that you have a spot worn in your chair. And welcome to you who have never been here before and are anxious about what will happen. And welcome to you who are our beloved brothers and sisters but are somewhere else this morning. You are all welcome. We are all welcome under the protective guiding wings of the creator God who made us, the redeemer God who has lifted us out of the pit of death, and the empowering God, Holy Spirit, who brings us into a new understanding. Welcome all of you everywhere as we together go to the throne of God and bask in the presence of the Holy One you are welcome today. Let us worship God together. Did you know they're predicting less fog on the beach today or in the town? Isn't that a happy thought? And so we will be um, joining responsively for our call to worship and hoping that God will help us to unfog our thinking and our emotions and our spirituality. So come, renewed people, creators of history, builders of new humanity, renewed people who live with adventures as they go on the long pilgrimage. Come, renewed people struggling to hope, thirsty pilgrims seeking truth and light, renewed people now free from their chains, renewed loving people demanding liberty we come on to pray. God, give us a new heart, strong enough to divide. Come, renewed people, loving without limit with regard to race or pride of place. Renewed people, standing by the poor, sharing bread with them. We come on to pray. God, give us a new heart, big enough to love, strong enough to divide and join me in the opening prayer. O oh, Jesus, be the canoe that holds me up in the sea of life. Be the rudder that helps me in the straight road. Be the onrigger that escorts me in times of temptation. Let your spirit be my sail. 
that carries me through each day. Keep my body strong so I can paddle steadfastly on in the voyage of life. Amen. And our opening hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King, uh, number 17, and we're going to be singing verses 1, 4, and 5. to confession. There is one who listens and rescues, and this is God's solemn charge. Do not try to hide from me the iniquity I already know. Face up to your sins and let go of it. Let's confess together. Forgive us when we forget to praise you, when we turn your love into legalism your freedom into slavery, your promises and gifts into demands and duties. Forgive us when we forget we are your people and we make your church an exclusive club. Forgive us when we forget that Jesus is our contemporary and we lock him up in forms of cousins words and structures. Forgive us, merciful God. Amen. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And as recipients of grace and mercy and forgiveness, we are offered the extraordinary joy and privilege of sharing peace with those around us. So I would invite you to stand, stay where you are, but offer signs of peace to those around you. May the peace of Jesus Christ be and abide with you now and forever. Peace be. Peace of Christ be. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
And we have a special piece of music this morning from Randy and Kathy entitled The Prayer. So if you hadn't noticed, the theme for today is prayer. We finished our long, long journey with the prayer that Jesus left as our example. Three months we spent on that extraordinary prayer, soaking up what seemed like the perfect words of the perfect prayer. And so today, 
I wasn't quite ready to leave the idea of prayer yet. So we're going to be looking at other prayers that other people prayed in Scripture. Some of them are not perfectly shaped, theologically tightly packed. Some of them are messy, but prayers they are. So, listen to the word of God for you this morning. From Paul's first letter to the Christians at Thessalonica, he says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation, because this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. I once wanted to be a dancer. And not when I was seven and could get away with wearing a pink tutu. I was a teenager, and I wanted to be a dancer. One of my jobs, I worked the backstage at the theater. And I remember very clearly when the Honolulu City Ballet was performing. And I would watch those dancers. Mm. My first paycheck, I bought myself some toe shoes. Which, if you know anything about dance, that's not where you start. <laughs> I did take some lessons, and I did learn to go on point. You see, when people who are when people who dance hear the music, we move our bodies. We bounce, or we sway, or we leap, or we tap. When the music is playing, we do that. When the music played, I danced. But I was not a dancer. A dancer is someone who is always dancing. A dancer, when the music comes on, they sway or waltz or pirouette. And when the music stops, they continue to dance. They dance when they are on stage. They dance when they are walking to the grocery store. They dance when they are mopping. They dance when they are limping. Every movement of their body is infused with the music from the core of their body to the tips of their fingers. It is always a dance. They are dancers. Paul talks about this. I know it doesn't look like it, but if you dig deep in the Greek, it's there, right, Phil? But he's talking about prayer. He's telling his friends in Thessalonica not just to be people who say prayers, but to be prayers. That every breath, every movement is a prayer, like every movement of the dancer is a dance. Pray with or without words. Like David. He was pretty heavy into prayer. These few verses from Psalm 139. You have searched me, O Lord. You know me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my home in the pit, there you are. If I rise with the wings of dawn, if I settle at the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. 
If I say, surely this darkness is covering me, and the night, the light has become like night around me, even that darkness will not be dark to you. That night, my night, will shine like the day in you. For darkness is as light to you. For David, it was seamless. It was without boundaries. Every circumstance, every place. And let me tell you, David had some circumstances. Did he not? I mean, an assassin chasing you? People telling you you need to be a ruler when you're just a kid? Trying to make a nation out of these warring tribes? Where can I go? David was a dancer of prayer. But this is also David. This is from Psalm 4. Answer me when I call you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Whether he is praising or whether he is grumbling, David thinks it's appropriate to put it in a prayer. To take it to the throne of the God who created the nebula. Being present to the presence of God is how Marjorie Thompson describes the foundation of all prayer in her book, The Soul Feast. Being present to the presence of God. Can it be that simple? Can it be that simple that it's just having an antenna? Not the fancy words. Not the right theology. Not the right attitude, not strong faith. But the being present to the presence of God. Hannah, remember Hannah? Hannah who was barren. Hannah, who could not do the one thing that a righteous Hebrew woman wanted to do, is to provide for the next generation, to provide the next generation of God's holy people. She says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, and I will give him back to you, Lord, for all the days of his life. She has nothing. The only thing that marks her as a faithful woman is elusive. And where does she go when there is nothing left? When everything else is gone? Abraham Lincoln is credited with saying, I have been driven to my knees many times by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. I mean, maybe it doesn't sound like the, the greatest witness of the Christian faith, right? Well, I didn't have any other choices, so let's go to God. <laughs> when I've tried everything else, when there are no other options, okay, God, hear me to be present to the presence of God when all else is vapor. Or how about this prayer of Daniel? Remember 
Daniel of the lion's den? Daniel who would not turn his back on God. He would rather be thrown into the pit with the lions. Daniel said this, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his commandments of love with those who love him and his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and rebelled. We have turned away. We have not listened to your prophets. Give ear our God, and here, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are so righteous. Daniel doesn't go to prayer because he's sure he's good enough to get what he asks for. In fact, he's really sure that he's bad enough to not get what he asked for. We do not come because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay. It's a messy prayer. It's a messy prayer where Daniel sort of lays out all the dirty laundry and has no confidence that there's any reason that Daniel warrants God's attention except for the fact that God is a God who listens. The kind of prayer that falls back, not on elegant, eloquent words, Oh, Jesus, here are your people gathered at Chapel by the Sea. We love you so much. We're so faithful. We're generous with our money. We care about our neighbors, so please listen. No, that is not the prayer. That is not the prayer. It's prayer because of the grace and the mercy of God. And then there's the prayer of Hagar, remember Hagar? Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. When Sarah just can't trust God's promise anymore that Sarah would bear a child that would become a great nation and inherit the eternal blessings of God, Sarah's like, well, I got that one wrong, obviously. And so Sarah scoots Hagar into Abraham's tent. Maybe you, maybe your womb is how this promise will be fulfilled. Well, and after that, surprise, Sarah gets jealous and mad at Hagar. Has Abraham send her out into the desert to die? And there she is, lost and utterly abandoned, and what does she pray? What is her prayer? She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That's it. Hagar's prayer is, you are the God who sees me. She doesn't even ask for anything. She doesn't fall on fancy words or theology. It's not a long line of prayer. Because sometimes when we hear Paul say, pray continually, <laughs> some of us say, okay, I'm ready, like a filibuster. That pray continually means this long list of endless words, and we just keep going. I got it, Paul. Take a sip of water. Keep going with all the words. You are the God who has seen me. It's not the length of the prayer. How many words? Hagar was present 
to the presence of God who was present to her presence. Or sometimes, sometimes prayer for me becomes a list. It's a task. Okay, I got him off the floor. I got to get the groceries. I got to weed the garden. I got to pray. And here are all the things I got to pray about. I got to do the help prayer. I got to do the thank you prayer. I got to do the wow prayer. And it's a conversation where I talk to God. I tell God stuff. Do you pray like that? You know, all the things God needs to know about. All the things down here that God needs an update. Yeah, that's the kind of prayer. Do you remember Flip Wilson? You're probably all too young for Flip Wilson. He used to say, I'm going to pray now. Anybody want anything? Right? That's what we just put in our order. DoorDash. Holy DoorDash. Maybe that's why we get so tired of prayer. When we think praying continually is this task of always talking to God with the fancy words and the perfect theology and the stellar reputation. Here's another prayer. This is Stephen. Recently, you studied this with Mark a couple of weeks ago, I think. Remember? Stephen, one of the first disciples, the first deacon who is preaching about Jesus to people who don't want to hear about Jesus. And they get so mad. There's so much that they don't want to hear this that he is being stoned. Shut up, Stephen. And while that is happening, while they are stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell down dead. Prayer for Stephen was not about telling God stuff. It wasn't about informing God. It was about aligning with God. So that in the prayer, Stephen is moved to be in the space and the grace that Jesus was in. So prayer is not primarily us informing God of stuff, but us aligning ourselves with God's activity with God's will, with God's heart, we, in our prayers, take a step closer. Our soul and our mind takes a step closer to being in this sync with God in the world. We spend a lot of time on the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord had another prayer, a lot of prayers, actually, one of them happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has had dinner with the disciples. They've gone in the night to pray. Jesus can maybe hear the footfalls of the soldiers as they walk through the Kidron Valley to come and get him. And Jesus says to the disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And then going a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. If there is any other option, God, if there's a sliver of a chance that we can do something else, then let's do something else. 
I've prayed that prayer <laughs> a time or two. Soren Kierkegaard, a very prolific theologian, said, a man prayed and at first thought that prayer was talking. But he became more and more quiet until in the end he realized that prayer is listening. Jesus says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. I don't want this. I don't like it. This is a stupid idea. You should change your plan. Yet, not as I will it, but as you will it. When we read this in the English translation, all that separates, don't do this from whatever you need to do, is a tiny little space. Scripture doesn't say how long it took, but I wonder, I wonder how much silence there was after Jesus said, no, 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 please, not this. And then was there this agonizing silence? The quiet of stopping talking and starting listening. How long was that silent listening before he could arrive at? Not as I will, but as you will. So that maybe the really crucial step in prayer is to be quiet and to listen. Listen to God's thoughts, God's desires, God's will, God's power. Anybody here have sleep apnea? Actually, I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> you don't have to admit it. But sleep apnea, I was astounded to realize that what sleep apnea is, is holding your breath without knowing it. Basically, right? <gasps> well, I know it. But sleep apnea is when you hold your breath and you don't know it. Sometimes I think I have prayer apnea. I don't mean to not pray. I don't make a decision. I'm going to be distracted. But I hold my breath. And what happens in sleep apnea? When you don't breathe without knowing it. Your brain gets starved. You wake up and your sleep is disturbed. There's all sorts of things that are out of whack in sleep apnea. And there are all sorts of things out of whack in prayer apnea. I never became a dancer. I, I know you were wondering. <laughs> I don't even have my, toe, my point shoes anymore. But I still dance sometimes when the music's on, mostly with Mark in the kitchen. But that's not enough. I don't want to be someone who prays. I want to be a prayer. To pray when there are words and to pray when there are not words to be sustained in our journey together. Because remember, every one of the pronouns in the Lord's Prayer is plural. We do this dancing together. So part of the reason that we join together, physically, spiritually, all the ways that we are the body of Christ is so that we can sustain each other, remind each other the presence of God is present here. You are in the presence of God. You don't have words? I can pray for you now. I don't have words. Can you pray for me? And together, 
together with Hagar, with David, with Stephen, with Jesus, we are present to the presence of God. There's one more prayer. This is Solomon's prayer. Remember, we talked before about how David wanted to build the temple for God, but didn't get to do that. He went to the lumber store and got a lot of materials, but it was his son Solomon who got to do that. And here is Solomon's prayer about that temple. But God, how could you possibly live on earth with people? If heaven, even the highest heaven, can't contain you, how can this temple that I have built contain you? Lord my God, listen to your servant's prayer and request. And hear the cry and prayer that I make to you. God, constantly watch over this temple. The place where you promise to put your name. And listen to the prayer your servant is praying. Listen to the request of your servant and your people, Israel. Listen from your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. And then a chapter later, Solomon finished the temple. He accomplished everything he intended. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said, I heard you. I have heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place as my house of sacrifice. When I close the sky so that there is no rain, or I order the locusts to consume the land, or I send a plague against my people, if my people, who belong to me, will humbly pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. From now on, my eyes will be open and my ears will pay attention to the prayers offered in this place because I have chosen this temple and declared it holy so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Well, God must have gotten it wrong because if you go to Jerusalem today, Solomon's temple's not there. Solomon's temple and the other temples that were built to replace it are rubble. Except, except, what is the temple? Paul, Phil, what is the temple? We are the temple. We are the temple. The body of Christ is the temple that God has chosen to indwell. From now on, my eyes will be open and my ears will pay attention to the prayers offered in my temple. Because I have chosen this temple and declared it holy so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Whatever the prayer, words or no words, faith or no faith, joy or no joy, despair or no despair, God listens, God hears, and is present with us. What do you say we dance? God of big ears, God of clear hearing and staunch faithfulness, we thank you that you hear our prayers, even the ones that we can't shape, we don't understand. Thank you that you hear, that you heal, 
and that you are present with us. Amen. In your bulletin and on your screen is a short affirmation of faith. And if you feel so bold, I would invite you to join me. If, if you notice, most of the prayers in worship this morning are from believers from around the world as we um, benefit from the prayers of other parts of the body of Christ. So will you join me in this affirmation of faith from M Mother Frances Dominica? Nothing in life is so insignificant, so small, that God cannot be found at its center. Amen? Amen. And I would invite you to join in the hymn prayer, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And in just a minute, we're going to go to prayer together. But first, there's a few announcements about the work of God through Chapel by the Sea. Um, today, we're going back to fellowship. Um, so you're invited to go into the fellowship hall. There's cake and fruit. It is a special celebration for Gary and Nancy's 50th wedding anniversary. And to celebrate that, they are giving us goodies. So you're invited to join after that. Um, knitting has not resumed on Mondays yet. The Oregon Coast Learning Institute will on Tuesday morning have its open house in the fellowship hall. You are all welcome to join in. Walking on Friday, this Thursday, there won't be soup with friends. Instead, we are having another parking lot vespers so come at four o'clock for some prayer for some singing for some scripture and conversation and then immediately after ice cream social 
We will provide the ice cream. We're asking you to bring toppings, sprinkles, chocolate chips, strawberries, jalapeno peppers, whatever. <laughs> and then Friday, Bible study with Dr. Phil, um, still going on the book of Isaiah. Um, and this Saturday, a week from yesterday, at 2 o'clock, you are all invited. We will gather here in remembrance of our dearly beloved Patsy McLean and have a memorial, a celebration of her life. So you are welcome to join us 2 o'clock on Saturday. I believe that's all the announcements. Let us go together to prayer. Let us go together to God. And listen, not only as we lift up our prayers, but listen for the breathing of David and Hagar and Stephen and Daniel and Hannah and Jesus who meet us there. God who hears. God who forgives and heals. God who brings justice and freedom. You have heard the prayers that we have spoken out loud. Prayers of great joy and thanksgiving for, for faithful love. We join in prayers for the children of the world. Minds ready to learn. We pray that there would be good, solid teaching. For those who teach, that you would infuse them with grace and strength and clarity for the parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles and neighbors and friends, may we always, God, nurture the children you have given us. And we celebrate every act of healing and every healer you send our way, Lord. And we also pray for those who still struggle with illness of one kind and another. And God, hear us when we join around those words that Jesus left as an example, calling on you, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as an act of worship, not because we're trying to buy something from God, not because we have a bill that we have to pay, but because we are so committed so thrilled with what God is doing through Chapel by the Sea and our life together. You are invited to bring your offerings, your pledges, your tithes, the kind that you put in the plate at the back of the sanctuary, the kind that you put in an envelope and mail into the church, the kind that you can give by using the online button on the website, and the ones, the offerings that you make by the words that you speak the actions that you take, the places that you go, bring all of these as an offering to God.
we bring these gifts to you, God. The ones that are the result of the sweat of our brow, the work of our hands. And the ones that are the result of our prayers and our actions. We ask that you would take these gifts, bless them, and use them to do your will around the world, in and for and through us. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, Go With Us, Lord, which is a sweet, tender, little prayer. And if you are so inclined, I invite you to stand as we're going we're gonna to sing it through twice. What did you say? Go with us, Lord, and guide the way through this and every calling day. Find in your spirit strong and true. Our hearts may be our gift to you. And so... You are charged to go out into the world where things may or may not go according to plan. But go out anyway and dance and pray and listen and watch for the God who is present to you. And as you go, take with you this blessing. May the love of God lift you May the grace of Christ heal you and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uphold you from this day into eternity. Amen.